School's gonna open next week. Speed limit's 50. 500 of those a day. And you can't sit out there anyway because it's just bang, 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 beep, 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 crash, 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 all day long. In my mind, there are messages coming from the very top that this quarry is going to stay. Period. And eventually we'll wear out the people or they'll die. I, I feel for them. I have empathy for them. I understand that something happened in their lives that they didn't invite and it's having an impact on them. And the government says, I've had one, one uh, staffer tell me, we've done all we can do, right? And I'm saying, no, you haven't done all you can do. You, you've decided not to do anymore. Living in this dust and dirt. <laughs> I could just sit and cry. <laughs> yeah. That's my final thought. Yeah. I could just sit yeah. and cry. No, we're, we're, going, we're going to have to move out. Yeah, we probably will. Within two years, we won't be here. I that if somebody gets killed in my driveway, I have to deal with it the rest of my life. The trucks gear up from meeting the main road there. I hear every gear of every truck every minute uh, all day long. I can't get away from that. It's in my mind. And my wife can't either. We have to suffer with people making money and, and, and government not looking responsible for what they've done to us. They don't, th they don't think it's as bad as what we're saying. We wouldn't have kept this going for six years if it hadn't been so bad. So what else can I say, Dennis? I am thoroughly fed up with this all. And I'm really ashamed of what we have for politicians and bureaucrats. The Myra Quarry, which started in 2014 and was approved by the Alward government, is owned by Myra Construction, and managed by Adrian Pembridge. The quarry was originally pitched as a rock pit, and at the last moment was switched to being a quarry. And the approval goes through the local service district for Estes Bridge, and it's an agricultural rural zoning, and it includes an environmentally protected area for five endangered species. The quarry also operates over the third largest aquifer in Canada. Here's a Google image that shows the quarry. It's in the upper left corner and it's the gray patch. Right beside it is the Gilrich Golf Course, just to the west, and below the golf course is the Cloudy Road, which has about 15 or 20 houses. Trucks used to take the Cloudy Road to get down to Route 105. It's a distance of maybe two and a half kilometers. But the city and engineer Sean Lee sent a letter to Myra Quarry telling them they had to stop doing this. Quote, it is the city's responsibility to ensure that a regular city street, i.e. a non-trucking route, is not used as a haul route from a pit outside the city. The consequence of Mr. Lee and the city of Fredericton's decision led to the construction of a haul road through an environmentally protected area for five at-risk species and 500 trucks a day through a densely populated area, including several businesses, an elementary school, and a seniors care facility. Plus, it is a distance of five kilometers to get to the Route 105. Sadly, a third option was available by building a haul road directly down to the 105 from the quarry. This would have protected the citizens, both Cloudy and Royal Road, and protected the endangered species in the environmentally protected area. There is no explanation as to why this was not done. So, to get you to understand what it's like, I wanted to take you there. This is the entrance to the Myra Quarry on the Royal Road. Hundreds of trucks a day leave the quarry at the top of the hill come down this hall road and go into Fredericton. Goes past the school, goes past the seniors' residence, and over a hundred homes. You have to see it to believe it. That bridge 
goes over a protected area for wildlife. And that stream is now polluted with silica dust. When interviewing people about the quarry on the Royal Road, and we're at the top of the Royal Road here heading into Fredericton, they talk about all the rocks that fall off the trucks because they don't put the canopy over top to stop the spillage. And you can see how narrow the road is. So when I was driving out to shoot some of this footage, I noticed right here on the side of the road, there's one rock that they're talking about. It comes from the quarry. Off the back of a truck going about 80 kilometers an hour. And just up here in the distance is the first one I saw when I was heading out. We're going to pick that one up and bring it home. And here's the other chunk of rock that came off the back of a truck. If we pick it up, you can tell. Oh, she weighs, oh, easily weighs about four pounds, five pounds. Imagine that hitting you coming off the back of a truck. Here's the other one. We'll pick them both up, bring them back. There you go, two big chunks of rock. And just over that hill, there's skid marks all over the road from trucks slamming on their brakes because of people taking a left turn into a dog daycare. School's gonna open next week. Speed limit's 50. 500 of those a day. And the entrance to the school is right there. And where I picked up the rock, it's just around the corner where that car's going now. And there's the seniors care facility. This close to the railroad. And the heavy truck traffic because of a quarry less than a kilometer on the outskirts of city limit of Fredericton. And they're about to head uphill right past that school past all those houses. Two seconds later, here comes another one. So if you lived in those windows, all you're gonna hear is truck traffic. August 14th of 2020, I emailed Mr. Lee of the City of Fredericton Engineering Department and I asked him, could he explain why the residents of Royal Road were not given the same protection as the residents of Cloudy Road? It's now over a month later and I still have yet to receive a response. The residents of Royal Road have lived with the impact of the Meyer Quarry now for six years. Here are some of their stories, their words, frustrations, anger, sadness. Feels like victim impact statements. And yet there is no court to hear them. Their government continues to ghost them and protect the quarry instead. You can't put a little pool out there anymore to cool off because it just gets full of shit and dust. and. And you can't sit out there anyway because it's just bang, 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 beep, 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 crash, 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 all day long. In my mind, there are messages coming from the very top that this quarry is going to stay. Period. 
and eventually will wear out the people or they'll die. What happened to those people, right? I, I feel for them. I have empathy for them. I understand that something happened in their lives that they didn't invite and it's having an impact on them. That bothers me to the point where, where, where we go to the government and we try to get the government to do things and the government says, I've had one, one uh, staffer tell me, we've done all we can do, right? And I'm saying, no, you haven't done all you can do. You, you've decided not to do any more. But we're a quarter of a mile from the city, the city line's right up the hill here. Yeah, it's just up the hill. Yeah, and uh, it was perfect for us because it was just outside, the taxes were good. Yeah. The scenery was excellent. Yeah. No noise. Yeah. Quiet. Yeah. Animals, wildlife. Yeah. And we thought it was a great spot to bring our kids up. Yeah. Oh, we don't want to leave it to our kids now and grandkids. We don't want them living in this dust and dirt. <laughs> I could just sit and cry. Yeah. That's my final thought. Yeah. I could just sit yeah. and cry. No, we're we're going we're going to have to move out. Yeah, we're going to move out. Within two years, we won't be here. Are you coming with us? And then we end up having this thrown upon us six years ago, without the the governing bodies following the proper rules. That if somebody gets killed in my driveway. I have to deal with it the rest of my life. The trucks gear up from meeting the main road there. I hear every gear of every truck every minute uh, all day long. I can't get away from that. It's in my mind. And my wife can't either. And these people can't. So what do they do? We have to suffer with people making money and, and, and government not looking responsible for what they've done to us. They don't, th they don't think it's as bad as what we're saying. We wouldn't have kept this going for six years if it hadn't been so bad. So what else can I say, Dennis? I am thoroughly fed up with this all. And I'm really ashamed of what we have for politicians and bureaucrats. How's your heart and soul? It's sad. It really, it's really sad because that literally is my home. I was born there. I bought a house there. And it just seems like it's all been taken away. Everything's been taken away. The, there was somebody that came from the engineering company that was measuring the, the sound or the, the the quake, like the vibrations, I guess, they came down and they're like, oh, well, you must be glad that the, at least the blast is gone because there's been drilling going on for the last few months. They won't be drilling again for another few months. So, you, you know, you won't have to hear the sound of that. Well, they're already drilling again. That's pretty frustrating. It's, it's a constant drill. So, you know, I met my parents two or three times a week with my children enjoying their home as much as we can, but you sit on the back deck and all you hear are trucks and this drill that's constant all day long. And it's, you know, it's, I imagine if you were closer, it'd be really high pitched screech, but it's just a constant, like, yeah, what you can, yeah, what you can imagine a drill going through rock would be, and it's right in your backyard and they're in a valley. So it's probably amplified being in there. Yeah. And uh, it's been a few things that scare me, you know, um, those transport trucks that drive by there was um, a big rock that fell off one and was right in their driveway. Well, what if my son had been riding his bike in their driveway? Or there was a day that we were driving, they were driving me home in their vehicle and a dump truck had gone up the highway and there was rocks, like fairly big sized rocks all over the highway. And my dad had to swerve to take the ground. My, both my kids are in the car with us. You know, that's dangerous. Because I see those trucks every like constantly and there's not a minute between those trucks it's it's sad we talk about it all the time it's a conversation we have almost daily what we're going to do and we don't know what we're going to do because we have to, we can't move without having the value of our house to you know we can't buy another house we can't just leave the house what do you do i don't know 
They could have a protocol that these things shouldn't be anywhere near people's long-standing residential areas. This thing was plopped right into a long-standing residential area. That was zoned as a long-standing residential area, and then they changed it for this guy. He got an environmental impact waiver for a gravel pit, not for an industrial rock quarry. He got his environmental waiver for being in Douglas. He is in Estes Bridge, where his haul-out road is basically ruining the lives of people with all the trucks going by on a daily basis, 500 trucks a day. The Myra Quarry permit was renewed last November. The Deputy Minister of Environment, Perry Haynes, was directly called out for not addressing long-standing questions dating back to 2014 immediately prior to the decision being made. Perry Haynes has not answered any of these questions in the interim since. Neither has Jeff Carr. I guess I could say one other thing. Three cheers to those of you watching who have taken on what I'm describing in your own ways. Functioning democracy really suffers absent people like you. So how does it come to this with business decision-making on development for New Brunswick and the relationship between the community, the government of the day, and the environment? Recently, I had a chance to interview Stephen Horseman during the last provincial election in September of 2020, and I approached this subject with him. Um, I want to wander into a, a specific, and, in, uh, and, and we'll just see where it goes. Sure. If that's good. Um, and it ties back to the previous conversations with RPC putting out their model of uh, here's all the mining opportunities um, in the province. And then I can show a map of here's all the waterways in the province and you put the two on top of each other and you know there's, I don't want to say conflict, but it's going to be a challenge to get all of this sort of uh, manufacturing industrial development to drive the economy um, as opposed to how do we protect the environment mm. so that it's here for the 120 years. So those are two givens. So the, the dance is what happens in between. Is that the precursor for the Sisson mine? Or, so here's a provincial view of economic development. <laughs> and then here's a provincial view of environmental sustainability. And those two themes will play out in the legislature. And here's a specific example of where that's right now not, it's not a happy place. Yeah. Um, can you speak into that space? Sure. Today? And I'll, I want to start right from the beginning. Uh, it was the PC government between 2010 and 2014 that okayed that Myra, Myra Corey out the mm -hmm. Royal Road. Mm -hmm. uh, we had just come in. Uh, so that paperwork was already done. They did their studies. They did their whatever they needed to do. Mm. Uh, and they they okayed the Myra. So we came in 2014 to 2018. Mm. Uh, we, we've been dealing with that ever since. And look, how can you how can you give a company something like Myra Construction uh, the okay and, and start their uh, construct or their demolition or yeah. rock and, you know, the dust and mud and, yeah. and then all of a sudden halt it? I, I, it's like it's like trying to hold back the wind. Uh, you, you can't. Yep. So you have to work together. Um, so compensation. So they they watered the road. They pay the road. So there's there's less and less dust. I, I don't know. Yeah. So what I meant by compensation was the homeowners, because you right. know the property values have dropped by seventy thousand yep. on one hundred eighty thousand. Yep. And yep. So. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure if you want me to make promise. I can't. No, I can't no, no. I'm not saying, yeah. Look. No, uh, no, no. I'm just trying to talk should have, about something. Should have been done. I don't want to paint it as a conflict. I want to no, paint no. it as what's the solution to yeah. this? So I think the solution was would be right from the beginning is to consult with the community better, hmm. um, to say that this is what's going to take place. How can we help you uh, keep your properties at the value that they are? How can we uh, keep down the, the dust or the trucking traffic to keep people safe? Mm -hmm. That should have been all done in the beginning. And I think with the CIS and mine, I thought at the beginning, uh, working with our First Nations, that uh, they signed an agreement uh, of $2.5 million to look, this is this is not to, not to that is coming, yeah, yeah. but uh, to, to, to look at it yeah. and, and to be a part of the issue. Uh, so First Nations, the community, the environmentalist, um, that all has to be done at the front end. Hmm. Um, at any major project, I think it should be done at the front end. Hmm. Even here at the uh, Queen Square uh, area, <laughs> that wasn't done. And that should have been done at the front end. If, if it's done at the front end, uh, I think projects, if they get the okay by, by the community, hmm. It, it would run smoother. Well, it's a consensus model as opposed it, it, to I'm in power to, and we're yeah, going to make no, this look, happen. Yeah, no, look, 100%. And, and I've never been 
uh, part of uh, ramming things through. It's always been about consulting. So a government comes in or on a campaign trail and promises, oh, we're going to grow the economy and create more jobs. Yeah. You build on a, on a success and, a, and a, a continuous improvement kind of program in every sector. And with, with economic development, it's like how knowledgeable are the people in the departments that actually can look around this province and say, where's our niche opportunity? Hmm. Where do we have an opportunity? It's not wait for a government to come along and invent this, but be building and, and identifying every day. So when a government comes in to say, look, we've been doing a study around the world. Here's something that works for New Brunswick. We need to get on side and we need to find ways to make our province attractive for this particular industry or this particular venture uh, because it is, it's real so that you have consistency in the evaluation, the, the view beyond a, an election cycle. Yep. It has to be the 15, the 20, the 25 year view. What we observe sometimes is that uh, governments and the citizens are talking past each other. Hmm. And the government is responding in a kind of a safe boilerplate way because the people who are, who are mouthing those responses aren't the ones making the decision. So they have to be very careful about the words they use. Hmm. And on the other side, the disconnect is enormous because the people on the other other side are aware that they're not in a real conversation. Yes. I'm not actually being listened to. Yep. I say what I say, and then you say whatever's on your piece of paper. That's not a conversation, right? Yes, yes. Uh, Maybe you can see that the deficits are constantly increasing, mm -hmm. right? There's a shrinking resources, and every single one of these projects that the province has gotten involved in has lost money. So at some point, people would say, well, maybe we should stop you know, doing this, the same thing, giving out the corporate welfare, giving out the, any, any tax breaks or anything else to companies doesn't generate anything for the province in the end. So my experience was after, you know, fighting corruption overseas, uh, and mostly in, in sort of fragile states, conflict zones, um, to come back and see what's going on in the province was my motivation for then starting to say, no, we have to do something here. So for the last couple of years I've done what I can basically while I'm home is to be able to look at what can change. The The fact is is that in most third world countries it's far easier to do that. So I find it far easier to work in Afghanistan where there's a recognition that they have a corruption problem. Okay. There is no mass recognition among the political elites here that there is a problem. They don't see the problem. It started with the Allward government. There was David Allward uh, Blaine Higgs we know, Dan Soucy, uh, Troy Lifford was the MP for the area in Douglas, uh, which put it through so he would have known about it. MP or MLA? Uh, he's an MLA, um, not our, our part, but Kirk McDonald was our MLA and yep. he should have known about it too. Yep. Good. Um, Regional Service Commission, there was Dallas Gillis, Steve McAllen and Rob Kelly. They were all part of it. Uh, and then we also had the PRAC which Eldon Hunter and uh, the ombudsman knew about it, Charles Murray. So there it went through to the Liberal government uh, and the Liberal government, uh, Brian Glant, would not talk to any of us. They were quiet, uh, they just uh, kind of rode the wave and um, many things happened in that government. Uh, Brian Glant, Stephen Horseman, uh, Kelly Simmons, the bureaucrats uh, got into it. They knew what was going on right from the very beginning. Uh, Perry Haynes, Brian Kenny, Minister of Environment. Serge Roussel was another Minister of Environment. And then the regulars in the Regional Service Commission, Steve uh, McAlinden. And Picture this now. You're a participant in a closed door meeting trying to justify six years worth of this type of governance and civil service. Reasonable questions like these stonewalled. Forthright correspondence, like the following, never accorded the courtesy of a response. So what's it been like working on that over the past four or five years? Frustrating, yeah. I, I you know, I, I guess I grew up and, and, and matured with this idea that, that, that local government, which is elected by the people in our LSD, to advise the minister would actually be part of the process and that they would actually like to talk to us about about issues in our LSD. Mm -hmm. But I was wrong. I, I think we're just there so that they say they have that particular committee for no particular purpose. Mm -hmm. Because for five years we tried to 
to get a meeting with the minister f for the people in, in, in this area of, of, of the quarry, the, what we call the valley, the 40 families or so. No, no luck. No meetings. Well, we got meetings with mid-level civil servants who pat you on the head and tell you they understand. And it's like going into a meeting and they like to gang up on you. There might be seven of those people for one of me. And uh, of course, I have to lose my temper at that time. I'm not even sure that the government really cared about the cheap rock. I think they cared about the people who had supported them politically in the past who were involved in the project. I've not got any proof of that, but yeah. uh, I, it just seems that we get close to something and then we get shut down. Uh, the process seemed to be pretty quick by government standards to get the whole thing approved. And any conversation around issues like rerouting the Hall Road even before it were, were built was built was was a conversation they didn't wish to engage in. I think it was all pretty much signed and sealed before the uh, public meetings actually occurred. So it just seems that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a public meeting and 90 or 95 percent of the comments are negative, and then you go forward with the project. Period. I mean, suspiciously seems like they had already decided. It didn't matter what the people of Douglas said or felt or the people of Essie's Bridge felt or thought. The horrible thing is, is in when you go, get into meetings that are in camera, they, they are ready to admit that they botched the whole thing because it was really an Estes Bridge impact, but it was t tailored as a Douglas local service district initiative. Estes Bridge people are the ones that are getting whacked there, and the ministerial regulations for Estes Bridge say none of this is allowed. It's really difficult to follow the conversation string between the civil servants, the politicians, how the ombud laid out the disconnect in the conversations that can happen, and then the real-life experience by the community when trying to deal with government on how that quarry got put into a rural agricultural area and the risk that is posed to everyone. Is the economic benefit of cheap rock greater than the economic impact of lost value in your houses and lost value in your quality of life? And that, that there's no place to have that conversation is the most stunning part of it all. What's most important here is the gap, the thing that's missing, which is the connection between government civil service, and the community. It's almost as if the quarry is more important than the citizens and that the quarry is going to be protected no matter what. And citizens, good luck, you're on your own when it's supposed to be the other way around. And one of the greatest impacts of all of this is on their quality of life and on their health the dust we live our lives trying not to get cancer, uh, hoping that, uh, that the things you've done in the past will, will not erupt in the future for cancer. And now with the silicone dust, uh, we're, forced, we're forced into a cancer creative world that we have zero control of. And I feel that because of that, nobody really, or nobody really cares about our health and well-being on that side of things, and if we do get sick, who's going to take care of us? Well, it's going to be the government, but the government has caused this due to the, the not playing by the rules. It's, not, it's, it's a, it's a catch-22, it's a round circle, right? clock is right there. I hear a truck. I look at the clock. Mm -hmm. And I used to make all kinds of notes. Yeah. I'd, I'd make the time, I'd, I'd, the, the type of truck it was, and the whole yeah. bit. But then I just gave up on that because... Yeah, well, you keep a log and nobody's listening. No, so nobody's listening, point, so I quit. Right? Give up. Yeah, but anyway, I mean, I can sit there, and the trucks, I got one's going this way and one's going this way, and they're passing, crossing each other right in front of our living room window. Hmm. And the rattling and the dust. And the rocks, dust. yeah. And the, but any, truck, any vehicle that comes down, especially the cowboys that drive along here, they're just zooming, and it... The dust is flying. The dust is flying from every, every, every vehicle. vehicle that goes by. 
like you know because it's it's there the it's, on, it's, on, it's on the it's on the road and then the other cars hit it and poof, so it's steady oh yeah a day or two ago i was coming home and i was coming down bluff hill and i looked over or just before i got got to the turn itself up there and that whole ridge just. from up there you could see it you know coming home the whole ridge was just and i thought Oh, if I only had a movie camera right now, Probably. you know, because it was just, yeah. it was just, yeah. it, almost like a little forest fire. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference no. which way the wind blows. No. When the it trucks really go through, they pick up speed, they're going about 20 or 30 miles an hour when they hit our driveway. And at that point, when they get that speed, all the dust that's on that truck blows off it from that, from whatever they picked up in that quarry. And, and down through mm -hmm. and right at that point that's when the dust comes off starts to come off mm -hmm. and it's our house Judas's house and everybody else's house yeah. one morning I followed one of the trucks down it wasn't a one of the, the long the long trucks it was one of the yeah. smaller trucks yep yeah. it was eight o'clock in the morning and the sun was coming right level Cross the rays are coming right, there, right through. Right yep. there on the top of the hill. I followed that truck from from my driveway to up the top of Ring Road, and the dust was still coming off. Mm. That's what about three miles. Yeah. Mm. Yep. And it was still coming. Well, I swung left the two nations crossing. He went straight through. So that's how long the dust lasts on that truck. Every truck. Has there been anybody from the health department talk to you about? The silica dust, because it's not no, just nobody dust. Talk, no, no. Uh, well, Jerry has done most of the talking to them. Yeah. yeah. Nobody, nobody's, nobody's ever, ever visited, ever us, visited and us and said, look, dude, you got any problems here? Never. Nobody, none. Are you worried about your health? Hmm. She Sorry. wants to move out. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm away all day, so it's yeah. it kind of tapers off by I've six o'clock. I've been looking at apartments. Yeah. She's been looking at apartments. <laughs> That's the God. Yeah. And so I imagine it's, you know, it's probably aging him and uh, even the health concerns that come along with it is kind of scary to think about what it might be doing to their health and, and my health and my children's health. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of stress on everybody. It's scary. Yep. <laughs> it's, you know, the dust every day, you know. <laughs> and the dust isn't just dust, is it? No, it's poison. <laughs> yeah, that's something the general audience sort of wouldn't get. You know, mm -hmm. that it's silica dust and yeah. it's like breathing asbestos. Yeah. Last weekend when we were at their house and we were sitting on the deck, we had to go inside after the blast because you could just see this big puff of dust coming towards their house. The way the wind was blowing, it just came and sat over their house and settled on their deck and in their house, you know. How much of that are they breathing in and ingesting? I'm concerned a little bit, you know, like not even a little bit, a lot, I guess, about health issues you know my children are there mm. we're very close to my parents we we visit a few times a week and you know that's kind of scary i i hope <laughs> but what do you do right i don't know like it's like how would you test for the impact of silica dust on a two-year-old exactly i mean just a couple of weeks ago their water was tested and came back with dangerous metals in their water and you know my son's probably been drinking that water it it's supposedly supposed to um any um bring on learning disabilities and whatnot now my son hasn't shown any sign of that but <laughs> later on you know i don't know yeah. it could just the fact you have to entertain that thought yeah yeah we, we had a rural plan in place mm -hmm. which which would mean that they couldn't put the hall road where they did, mm -hmm. but they put it there anyway. And they're not interested in the fact. I mean, there are other governance within that document that suggests that, that enhancements or industry or building or whatever can't detract from the, uh, the ability of the persons already there to enjoy their property. Well, I think it did, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it's not much teeth in that document. I think the biggest heartbreak is just what's happened to the people who live there, mm -hmm. and you know, and we can talk about those those issues. They're economic, they're uh, 
loss of, of value. They're uh, health related. There isn't a person who lives there that can enjoy their property in the summer until, you know, after seven o'clock at night, and then they have to go out and clean the dust off everything before they can sit down in their lawn chair. There's people who have to change the filters on their air conditioners like five times as often as they used to. It used to be good for the whole summer, and now it's every three or four weeks. They got to clean them up because it's just sucking dust all the time. And people tell me that they used to spend all their spare time on their deck, and now they spend it indoors. Turn on the air and close all the windows. Can't tell summer from winter. Yeah, and, and there are actually standards in the province and in the country for the amount of noise that workers can be exposed to under the worker compensation, you know, whatever. I don't know what it's worker called. But they set levels. And, and for noise, they not only set levels, they set time limits. Hmm. Like if it exceeds a certain level, then maybe it's half an hour and it might be three hours and it works all the way down to like 15 minutes and yet these people are exposed to ex to very significant levels of noise i'm not exactly sure how significant they are because the department is not terribly willing to to share that information um, I mean, there are people at the department who have told Jerry that they've been told not to give him anything. I worry about our health a lot, mm -hmm. especially with the dust. I mean, that I never had allergies until the last couple of years. You know, I take allergy pills every day now. And that's just one thing. I mean, we don't even know what else it's doing to our lungs and bringing that out. And I, I for on a personal level, the dust is one of the biggest things for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can see it in your house, you can see it in your car, you can see, I mean, it's everywhere. And it is a thick coat of dust. They, they are ready to admit that they botched the whole thing because it was really an Estes Bridge impact, but it was t tailored as a Douglas Local Service District initiative. Estes Bridge people are the ones that are getting whacked there, and the ministerial regulations for Estes Bridge say none of this is allowed. None of what's going on. You live in a residential agricultural zone, and not only that, water is a very important part of where you live, so we're going to protect your well water. The dust, for example, um, late April, early May, there was this um, whining, high-pitched sound coming from the quarry and it lasted for about two weeks. So I was, was, I was unable to open my windows because it, it was just constant, constant, all day long. Um, I later found out it, it's because they were putting in some pipes or something because they were blasting mm. and they blasted. Mm. Um, but I couldn't open up my windows and enjoy the spring. I couldn't go outside. Uh, even when my dog would go out to pee, he would, there was a few times where he would whine because the pitch was so high. Um, the dust is terrible. Um, I live on the west side of the road uh, where Jerry uh, lives. Yeah. And from the Rock Quarry uh, Road all the way down to probably the top of the hill going towards town yeah. is completely white. Yeah. And then the, the other side of the road is pavement. And that's from all the dust um, fallen. Can, and does that depend on which way the wind's blowing, or that doesn't matter? No, it doesn't matter. It's just there constantly. And I couldn't, I couldn't open my window. Um, I couldn't let the spring air in. And it was really depressing at that time because it was also COVID. People are in lockdown. Um, you know, you want to spring clean. You want to go outside, enjoy the sun. Um, you can't do that because you've got the quarry in your backyard um, where it's just a constant banging and thrashing and beeping and uh, the noise is constant from six o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night and then you want to go out in your front yard and you can't because you know I'm quite close to the road so the trucks are just whizzing by every 30 40 50 seconds you know the yeah. noise the noise is terrible Many times too, I asked them for dust records uh, that were Myra in the early a in the early years, and uh, they couldn't give me dust records because they weren't done. 
And when this originally started, they were worried about the wells. They wanted to test the wells. Well, he has a well on the golf course, but it's his well, so yeah. he can do what he wants with it. They never did uh, check my well. They never did check the couple houses around them, but they had uh, records of five or six wells they had checked. Um, right now, with my problems in my water, I told the, uh, the environment rep that I didn't want him to go back and tell anybody from the environment until I'm sure um, what's going on here. Um, now that everybody knows this comes out, my well is bad. Okay? And uh, other people will check theirs and then we'll go from there. Every day uh, I hear, starting at probably around 6 o'clock, um, they open up the quarry. Uh, trucks, some trucks go up early, not all of them, but they, they start streaming in any time after that. And there could be two or three or four or five in a row going by the house. Uh, as of right now, like in the morning, we keep our windows open to cool the house down a bit. And uh, you can't hear the TV even when those trucks go by. But anyway, these trucks uh, enter the quarry across the Bailey Bridge. So the Bailey Bridge is noisy. The trucks bang across that, go through the way scales. Uh, they're not reading them at the time. They go up the hill, they lug up the hill. Some of them are very noisy. Um, trucks that you get with a quarry, some of them are brand new, some of them are very nice trucks, other ones are old beaters and they are extremely noisy. They go up and they park uh, and they back into the piles of rock or sand or whatever they want to get uh, loaded when 7 o'clock comes. And there could be, uh, it could be 5, 10, 15, 20 of them up there. Uh, the workers come anytime after 6, they drive up there uh, in in low slower times, there would be maybe four or five workers. Uh, they go up to twelve, I think. Um, the fuel truck comes also uh, at quarter to seven. Um, they all get everything running up there and get going uh, before seven. Um, the loaders, uh, even now, the loaders uh, start a little early. Uh, they go over and they start them up, maybe warm them up for a minute, maybe two minutes. Uh, go over to the trucks, back up alarms going. They uh, may sit and talk to the drivers in the trucks for a few minutes, um, watching the clock. And um, then at uh, seven, they, uh, they dump the loads in the trucks. Uh, the dump truck is the, the big one. It takes um, uh, maybe a minute, minute uh, to two minutes to load them. Uh, they uh, motor on down the hill. Some of them use the Jake brakes. Some of them just have very squeaky brakes. And you hear them coming down the hill. And they stop at the, at the weigh scales and um, then they go from there. Um, I can usually tell when they load them early because they go by my house at 7.06. I have exactly how long it takes to get the loader warmed up to go get them and to get back by my house and uh, Myra's boys are still pressing early. So uh, and I can prove this I have tapes of all this here and um, uh, the government will not do that. The government has taken over uh, kind of inspecting startup times when they do it. Uh, before it was Regional Service Commission and uh, we know what happened there. So um, they, they, haven't, they haven't checked to see how early they're starting, but they, they start early and then the trucks drive by my place with the dust and the noise and the stuff, uh, uh, you know, and it builds up at busy times, five to six hundred a day. So there we go. That's a typical bad day, along with all the other noises from the crusher and uh, the machinery working up there that echoes down into the valley. Um, that it is um, that is bad. Here are some brief bits to put the whole story into context. Perry Haynes was mentioned several times. He's the Assistant Deputy Minister of Authorizations and Compliance with the Department of Environment and Local Government. He's held that Assistant Deputy position since 2007. He also sits on the Management Board of the Canadian Rivers Institute. 
and in 2013 he was part of a team which created the New Brunswick Hydrographic Network, an authoritative water network for the province. How is it then he authorized and protected the Myra Quarry, which is destroying an environmentally protected waterway and which is located above the third largest aquifer in the country? I've made several requests to CBC English and asked, quote, I can find no stories on how the Myra Quarry came into existence or CBC coverage from the Myra Quarry perspective. I wanted to learn if our mainstream media did its job and investigated how this quarry bypassed a long list of rules, regulations, and laws. That was over two months ago. I'm still waiting for a response. Not only do the people of Royal Road have to put up with the noise and the dust and five-pound flying rocks or ghosting by the provincial government, they also have to put up with this and he's peeing by the side of the road by his truck. The silence from the civil servants and politicians is not unique to the Myra Quarry situation for the Royal Road residents. Here's a story from December 2018. Shows how the local service district there was not included, just like the local service district for Douglas and the local service district for Estes Bridge. It's a behavior pattern that you can identify if you do the work. Nat Purcell, former resident at Royal Road and a consummate researcher, found this the other day. In a landmark 2013 decision, Justice Preston concluded that, on all counts, the physical, environmental, biological, and social counts, the mine's economic benefits would not be sufficient to outweigh the negative costs. Simply put, one cannot live next to an active mine. There is no difference in the impact between a mine and a quarry. So pay attention, people. If you think this doesn't apply to you, then remember this is coming. RPC wants to mine the entire province. Here's an image that they put out just a couple of months ago of all the mining opportunities around the province. Now here's a map of all the waterways in the province. Mining and water protection do not go together in the same act. It's just not possible. Politicians and economists like Herb Emery continue to beat the drum about economic growth and they want to do it through developing natural resources. Here's a story of Premier Higgs talking to the federal government about transfer payments and in it he talks about expanding the growth of our natural resources as an economic driver. In this case, he wants to expand or take the moratorium off fracking. In late July of 2020, this story emerged from the shadows on how the Sisson Mine project was a generational opportunity. Just to put this in context, because it's hard to imagine, some wonderful artist put to scale the size of the Sisson Mine in relation to the area around Fredericton. To the left you see the big open pit, and to the right you see the tailing pond, and that it completely encapsulates the entire community of Fredericton. So to close all this off, while it's difficult to demonstrate the authorization of the Myra Quarry was illegally corrupt, it's quite clear the process was morally corrupt. At every turn, from every angle, our gut tells us something was wrong. The fact the residents of the Royal Road were left with poisoned air, poisoned water, devalued property which they'll never recover, risk to their health, risk to their personal safety, and ghosted by the very government and politicians that are elected to protect them. The moral corruption is blatant. Time to drink from the cup of responsibility, civil servants and politicians. Heal what's left of the souls of these people and heal what's left of the land, the air, and the water for all our sakes. Be good, have fun, and love each other. <laughs>